Justice advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Heather Moran, Executive Director of Six and I Historic Synagogue, former Executive Vice President of Global Programming and Strategy and Operations at National Geographic, also the former Vice President of Programming at E! Entertainment. She's former staff at Discovery Communications, and uh, is so glad to be on the show. I'm glad to have you. I'm How are so you doing? I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So the first question I'd like to pose to you, Heather, is what are you currently doing, or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Oh, it's a good question. I, It's interesting because this is a very new job for me. I've only been in Jewish communal service in the nonprofit world for about six months. Mm-hmm. So I Congratulations. Spent, thank you so much. I spent 20 years as a television executive. Hmm. So I would have had a very different answer then right. if you had asked me that question. But even as a television executive, I always worked in the world of nonfiction mm-hmm. um, and had a passion for documentary storytelling which is really what um, kind of I, I think I've been in, interested in education mm-hmm. um, and as a not as a professional but as just a kind of a person and as an active Jew mm-hmm. I've always been committed to my synagogue and to Jewish life and so making the move from television into nonprofit and into the Jewish communal world um, is a big change and now I feel like I can spend time doing all of these things that advance the public interest kind of as a career right? instead of having it be an ancillary piece of my life that I would do like in my spare time. It's always fun wrapping multiple identities into one vocation. You mention, um, though, your interest and your passion for documentary storytelling. That isn't perhaps the first thing that comes to the mind of a 14-year-old who thinks about what she wants to be when she grows up. <laughs> How do you become passionate about documentary filmmaking? I, the, the answer is easy. Um, I probably when I was about in seventh grade saw Indiana Jones, um, Rage of the Lost Ark, <laughs> and became obsessed with archaeology. Huh. So even at a very young age, in just kind of seventh and eighth grade, I asked for Hanukkah for a subscription to the Biblical Archaeology Review, right. which is very dorky. <laughs> um, but I, Did you hide that from your friends at school? I think that I didn't even realize it was dorky, so I didn't even know to hide it. I was always I always wore my geekiness kind of proudly. Uh-huh. Um, and I loved archaeology. I went to school. I went to GW mm-hmm. and was majoring in archaeology and spent my junior year abroad at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And when I was kind of living my dream on Masada, giving a oral presentation on the baths mm-hmm. of Masada, um, I realized that I was actually very bored. <laughs> and, and archaeology, when you look at, you know, the Indiana Jones series or when yeah. you watch documentaries about archaeology, it's all about the find. They don't spend a lot of time talking about the hours and hours of sifting through dirt um, to find, like, maybe one flower pot after so, spending weeks at a dig. It sounds like archaeology is a lot of the context, but the excitement of Indiana Jones is actually the interpersonal relations, which is really what you're emphasizing here at Six and I. Is that what really potentially might have attracted you to archaeology in the first place, like the human stories yes. that went... You're und- un- discovering those human stories. That's exactly right. The process of archaeology is actually quite boring. So the boring part was trying to find the pieces that might give you clues about the actual story, but it was the story that was exciting, and it was the finding of the story. You're like, I yes. can't wait to get there. That's exactly That's right. why it was so boring. Yes, I'm a plot whore. I just, I like, <laughs> I just like to get to the story, and yeah. that was one of – one of the big twists for me. And okay. so when I came back from Hebrew University, I realized I do not want to be an archaeologist, but man, would I love to tell the stories of great archaeological finds. And so that's really the turn that took me into nonfiction storytelling. Great. And then, of course, somehow that segued into a position at Discovery Communications, and you thought, well, one way to tell a story is through film. Definitely. Okay. And so that that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time at Discovery, specifically at TLC, at a time when uh, the focus of that network was really more science and history mm-hmm. than the lifestyle network it's become. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing. I got to watch documentaries from all around the world. My first 
kind of, I, I couldn't get a job in programming in the beginning, so I had to start in a sales job. But then you ended up actually leaving the organization as head of programming. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I, one of my favorite things to do at the Discovery Holiday Party with my husband mm -hmm. was to point to all the people who didn't give me a job. Really? Yes. But, oh, my gosh. It was so hard to get into television. And so um, what did they say? Like, did you ever point out to them? Did they, did, did they even remember that they had rejected you? It's funny. Some of them remembered, um, and some of them didn't. In fact, one of my really good friends... We worked very, very closely together. Yeah. Um, he was probably about, he's probably about ten or twelve years older than me. Um, I just never brought up the fact that he had kind of he had rejected me as an intern. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. Um, and years, years later, I said, you know, Jeff, I applied for an internship when I was a, when I was a senior at GW, and I didn't even get an interview. And he was like, with me? Like, that's impossible. And then I started to, like, talk about the job description. And he realized, oh, my God, it's totally true. Um, so I think it's – there are a lot of people who want to get into television. Uh -huh. And I didn't know one person. I had no contacts. I didn't understand about networking. And so – You were still able to eventually get into television. Then. Yes, how is it that you were able to overcome those odds? I'm very persistent. <laughs> That's a common I'm theme very here. Very persistent. And so I, I, I um, made a deal with myself. Okay. I graduated in May mm -hmm. that I would give myself until the end of August, mm -hmm. um, August 31st, to get a job. And if I didn't get a job at Discovery, I would move to New York and look for work there mm -hmm. in documentaries. And I started on August 28th. Wow. Um, but it was in the sales department, not the job that I wanted. But I thought, you know what? If I can just get my foot in the door, mm -hmm. um, eventually I'll be able to do the kind of work that I was able to do and that I wanted to do. So they couldn't have rejected you based on merit because you ultimately ended up being great at your job. What does that say? Because I'm just thinking a lot of the listeners today, some of them may be millennials, may have come out of college after or during the Great Recession. There could be older people too. There were there were recessions in the late 80s. There's been recessions throughout American history. Right. And there, as you just said, there's a lot of individuals who, regardless of your demographic and age bracket, may have encountered times when it was really tough to try oh, to find yeah. a job. And, and yet it wasn't really a reflection of you, right? Because he says he thinks you're now wonderful, but at the time. So what does that... I mean, I think it points to the importance of relationships and mm -hmm. the importance of networking and not being afraid to put yourself out there mm -hmm. and say what you want and be persistent. I, I made it my kind of mission to always um, – this is always a dangerous thing to say in a public forum, but I, I have stuck to it – always give the information on interview. You know, if somebody wants a piece of your time to talk about, you know, how to move forward in their career, I will always make time to do that because – it's so important to have these conversations. And I didn't know any of these things when I was trying to get into the workplace. What are a few things you learned? Like, what is networking? Someone may know that. And, and in D.C., they may think, oh, it means I go to a cocktail hour with other 22-year-old Hill staffer interns, and that's networking. Is that networking? It's, it's networking, I think, in some professions. I mm -hmm. mean, for me, what I have found personally and also found through the people that I've hired once I became mm -hmm. a hiring manager is – when you reach out to someone very personally and mm -hmm. say, you are doing something that I am really interested in and I think you're good at it, mm -hmm. um, can you spare some time to give me some tips? Um, that is an incredible way to get to know someone, to get your foot in the door, because it's easy to hire people that you have a f some type of familiarity with. Right. And so I have, you know, especially on TV, I had a boatload of resumes from mostly young people and some older people who were really interested in breaking into the industry. Mm -hmm. And if I ever had an entry-level job, mm -hmm. I, re I remember the ones that I had great informational interviews with. Yeah. There's one assistant um, that worked for me for, a for two years, and now she is a PR manager at National Geographic. She runs all the PR for National Geographic Wild, yeah. which is one of their cable networks. Um, she had an informational interview with me. I didn't have any job. She said, doesn't matter. I just mm -hmm. want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And then every six weeks, she would check in with me. And was that obnoxious to you? Um, it was not obnoxious to me because she didn't expect anything from me. She was just like, hey, by the way, I'm here. Um, and she asked nothing of me except to remember that she was around. 
Yeah. And she was so impressive when I first met her. Yeah. Um, that, she, you know, she's the first person that I thought of then when my when my assistant got promoted and I was hiring somebody else. Uh-huh. It's so interesting. It sounds like you really remember where you came from. It may be refreshing to the ears of some of our listeners to hear, like, wow, there's someone really out there in a leadership position who remembers what it was to be struggling and to be ignored. And, and you're really – you remember where you came from. Totally. Well, I'm from Philly. And I feel like, you know, when you're from Philly, you're scrappy. Um, I, I came from a neighborhood, like, mm, I would say middle class. Mm-hmm. Middle class, but on the – not on the upper middle class side. Okay. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of knives and drugs at my high school. And – you just I don't know. I didn't I didn't come from much, but my parents were both teachers. They really believed in education mm-hmm. um, and you know, always kept me safe and really told me that I could do whatever I wanted to do. And so throughout this whole course, Heather, you've actually remained Jewish and that's been a part of your identity totally. and yet and yet and so now for the first time, so you've been Jewish all this time, right? Yes. And you've been doing this, which you know is, is, is kind of tongue in cheek, because of course you have been. But you uh, you've been going through doing archaeology, now documentary filmmaking, the Learning Channel, going up National Geographic, you, just doing a whole bunch of different stuff. And now suddenly you find yourself in a role where you're like, wow, I can embrace both of them in the same time in this new, actually very special space. Because for our listeners who don't know, right, because there's some listeners who aren't from the D.C. area. Sure. What is so special about Six and I Historic Synagogue? It is more than just a traditional synagogue where you go to services. You know, it welcomes non-Jews. Please tell our listeners a little bit, what sure. is this place? I think it is it is a vibrant cultural center in the middle of downtown D.C. Mm-hmm. We have arts and culture events. We have live entertainment, music, and comedy, and just a very vibrant cultural experience mm-hmm. that you can get when you come through our doors. We also are a non-traditional synagogue. So mm-hmm. we have not only services every Friday night and sometimes Saturday morning. Um, Which but, for our listeners is the Jewish Sabbath. Yes, that's okay. exactly right. Um, and we have different different service leaders from mm-hmm. different um, places in Judaism. So a lot of times the synagogue is connected to a particular dom- denomination. Are non-Jews welcomed in the building? Absolutely. By the way, I'm married to a Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, my husband's Catholic, which was an interesting thing for someone, um, I think for me and him to deal with. We've been married in May. It'll be 20 years. Because you're not just Jewish, but you've actually experienced a little bit of modern orthodoxy in Judaism, right? So yes. you've become... At different points in your life, you've actually been quite observant of Judaism. In fact, when Sean and I got married, um, I observed the Jewish Sabbath, Mm -hmm. and we kept a kosher home for years. Hmm. And uh, we went to a um, a, a, a minion, Mm -hmm. so a a service. What is a minion? A minion, well, it depends who you ask. Um, Back in the day, a minion was defined as at least 10 men. Mm -hmm. Um, 10 Jewish men. 10 Jewish men. For what purpose? To pray. All right. Um, To pray, and in order... you know, the language is, is, is hard because I don't buy into this language. But um, growing up, you would hear that in order to actually pray and for God to hear you, you needed to be in a room with 10 Jewish There's like men. a community experience. There's a whole theological philosophy behind it. Okay. Yes. Anyway, we've defined the term. So. So, we, so we went to services in a synagogue in D.C. Um, for years, but it was mostly in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And one day, Sean, who's like amazing, turns mm-hmm. to me and says, you know, do you think maybe one time we could go to synagogue? By the way, we've been going for about 18 months. Do you Every, ever go to Catholic church? No. No. No mass. No mass. He um, didn't want that. He bought he into didn't. your Judaism. Is he Jewish now? He is not. So he's he's Catholic who doesn't really go to mass but prefers to go to synagogue. Yes. But doesn't want to convert. Right. And so <laughs> I, think, I think he would... He, he's very interesting in terms of the language that he uses around this. He doesn't really talk about it that much. Mm-hmm. I think he is he's very invested in the Jewish community, and he's very invested in our synagogue. Is in he fact, invested in, in, in the Christian community? No. Um, but he, he, he says all the time, he's like, you know, I'm not really a joiner. Like, that's not what he, that's not his thing. Yeah. Um, he has his identity. He's secure in it, but he's yes. also got other stuff. Okay. But we've raised two Jewish sons, and... Um, his family has been extraordinary about yeah. it. And at one point, when in the beginning, um, you know, I was still very observant. And he would, and I think we would go to Mass maybe for Christmas with, Christmas with his family. Mm-hmm. But he, he never went to Mass otherwise. How would you meet him? Um, he was my teaching assistant um, <laughs> <laughs> in radio television production at GW. So you um, were a professor? No. He was, no, I was the student. 
And you were the student. The oh. Yeah. So we, he's very smart. Um, and so even though we're the same age, he was kind of like a year advanced. Mm-hmm. And um, they pick out the smarty pants to be the TAs. So is he also in communication? He is. He, now he's in education. Okay. But when we graduated from GW, we didn't get together until after it was all over. So, um, And the reason that I ask, it's yeah. so actually relevant to your current job. You're the executive director of Six and I Historic Synagogue. I mean, aren't there people who've gone on dates who they've met here? There are people who've who've met here who've gotten married. Oh yeah, people we have met, six and I babies. They've started. They've made families. It's amazing. So this is really a community, and in fact, it brings a lot of people together of multiple faiths. Even in is is so yes. in, poignant with your story. And in fact, not only as 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 is anything you know, community includes people of different generations, includes romance, anything that a normal community might include anywhere in the world. Yes. You no, know, you have a community here, so people are meeting each other here. And this is actually the nexus of romance for some individuals who absolutely. come. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so fun when that happens. Mm-hmm. Every year um, at the Jewish New Year on Rosh Hashanah, it's called, we have a poster mm-hmm. of all the sixth and I kind of simchas, the happinesses that have gone on um, over the past year. So we have pictures of people who got married at sixth and I or had babies at sixth and I. Mm-hmm. And it's just a wonderful thing to be part of that community. Right. So you're creating this community. Once... What's it really like? I mean, I guess what's the importance? You obviously were able to make community a community of listeners, a community an audience, mm-hmm. right? When you were with Discovery and National Geographic and E, you you have millions of people around the country and the world who are listening to these programs and they're learning. But of course, the community that you're making here is a little bit different. Is that important to you? What are the differences? It, it's learn. very important. I mean, it's it's very personal. Um, you would. You don't really interact with viewers on a regular basis as mm-hmm. a television executive. Like people always have an opinion about TV. They may have seen your show, but it's not a huge part of their life. It's like a little piece of their entertainment. And there's like the audience, which is millions of people out there, yes. which is a lot less concrete than Sarah, who had you know who got married last Saturday at my at my work. I think that's exactly right. And mm-hmm. and people are very committed to this place. This place is important. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't it, – it isn't an easy job. There mm-hmm. are a lot of kind of difficult decisions that we have to make all the time. Mm-hmm. And so – um, if someone doesn't agree with the decision that you've made or right. a decision the staff made, they, um, one of the things I love about this community is they're happy to raise their hand and say, hey, you know what, this didn't feel right. Yeah. And that's a very, very different um, relationship that you build with people. So something else, um, not only are you building a concrete community on the ground here in Washington, D.C., but this is also kind of the go-to speaking stop store, tour, mm-hmm. um, speaking tour stop uh, in the D.C. area. So anyone who comes by with a book or or something, you know, they'll stop maybe at Politics and Prose, and they're gonna they're really gonna stop here. This is like the number one destination. What kind of people are coming by, and how did they start coming to a synagogue? Um, so. I think it's a real testament to the partnership that we have with Politics and Prose, which mm-hmm. started. I don't know exactly how many years ago, but right. probably close to 10 years ago, if not a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, because Sixth and I didn't have the pull to attract talent. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of a building and people weren't sure what we were going to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, of course, way before my time. But over time, mm-hmm. I-, I think the experience that artists and authors have when they come to Sixth and I, mm-hmm. the way the staff takes care of them, right. the beauty and the uniqueness of this historic space mm-hmm. is something that really transfix people and so um, you're getting i mean what are who are so you're getting supreme court justices oh yeah you're getting but then you're also on a less serious note you're getting comedians yes you're getting musical artists and you're getting film people and radio hosts right i mean it's all over the map i i think it, i couldn't have been more excited mm-hmm. um to start and i started in about august and then immediately in october november december it just it, it just picked up, and we've had so many people here since I've been here. My, the first event mm-hmm. that I was here for was Norm McDonald from Saturday Night Live, and mm-hmm. he was delightful. He, I think <laughs> he only did two events, maybe three across the country. Yeah. Um, and But Megan Kelly has been here, Andy Cohen, Michael Shabon, Trevor uh-huh. Noah. Right. Um, and David Frum from The Atlantic is coming Must next Must be fun week. to meet all these people. It's so fun to meet them. So – Suppose that, you know, I had some kind of crazy magical device and I could sit you in front of 22-year-old Heather Moran. And this is going to be July. And Heather is 
uh, has just graduated college and she's very frustrated applying for all these internships and keep getting rejected. And she's like, gosh, if I, if I don't get an internship by the end of August, I'm going to head up to New York City. So if you were to sit down with 22-year-old Heather Moran you know, and tell her about what's going to happen in her life and, and that it would all work, like how would you, what hmm. conversation would you have with her? That's an interesting question. I think I've always thought that there... Do you know that movie, Sliding Doors? It wasn't a yeah. particularly good movie, but the concept of it was really interesting. Yeah, Is like that, he got caught and he missed the train, and then yes. but then the other one, he made the train, so he saw his wife cheating on him or yes. something? Yes, and so it's like two totally different lives. Right. Like his, his life spikes in two different directions because right. he didn't get on that train. Right. I feel like that's... That's kind of the way the world works. And I have this vision of what, like, the Heather Moran life would look like if I had moved to New York, if I hadn't married Sean. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, what would I say to myself? Because you couldn't have foreseen where you are today. Right. That's true. I I would definitely say to myself, stick with this Sean Moran guy. (laughs) (laughs) Like, this is a good choice. Um, And because I do think that, um, you know, not to belabor the – the difficulties of being in a relationship with someone who doesn't share the same faith. Mm -hmm. But I really, as a Mm 22-year-old, was not sure that it was going to work out. Um, It kind of went against everything that I was ever told and and the way I was raised. And so it was a big risk to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But man, was it the right choice. So I would definitely reinforce that Sean Moran's the way to go. Um, (laughs) And also to just just keep it up and have faith in myself um, that eventually, if you kind of just push a bunch of different doors and you do it graciously um, and resourcefully, like one of those doors is going to open up for you. So historically, this is actually a house of faith. You just said faith yes. in yourself. What does it mean to have faith in yourself? And how is that at all related to the faith that has historically been uh, in this building and, and continues to be here in its traditional roles? Hmm. Faith in myself and faith as in like the Jewish faith. Right. I don't know how to answer that one. I think um, it's – I – this is very cheesy, but I do believe that the world works in mysterious ways that we're not really supposed to understand, but – And is having faith in God similar or akin to having – faith in yourself? I don't think so. I think, um, in my view, having faith in yourself... It's a lot of trust? It's it, it's a lot of trust, but it's also observation. You know, it's, it's having the ability to look at the things that you've done and the choices that you made and realize that, like, some of them are bad ones, and so that's okay. You make a change. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. Mm-hmm. And with the good ones, you know, constantly turning that that experience over and saying, what can I learn from this and how can I build on it and how can I make myself better? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not just for myself, but for others. Mm-hmm. And so I think, it, at least for me, and I have the great benefit of having two parents that also believed in me. Mm-hmm. So I was always, th- that was always reinforced. That like, Interesting. It's a turn, it's an interesting turn of phrase that your parents believe in you. Yes. Often in a Jewish faith, you say you believe in God. Right. But it's, it's a totally different like, I guess, meaning, right? So it's yes. the same English words, right. but believing in your daughter is like believing that you'll come through and stay true to your values, but believing in God is like a blind, is, is it a blind faith or like what? I, I think it's different for everybody. Yeah. Um, we One of the things that I find interesting about Judaism mm-hmm. is depending where you are, mm-hmm. you can spend a lot of time in Jewish organizations or even houses of faith and not talk about God at all. Right. Um, so there are... Because the Ju- Jewish people is really what constitutes Judaism. It, Again, depends who you ask, right? There are places of Jewish faith where God is... It's like the Torah. Is, it's, it's everywhere it's all the time. Yeah. And to be fair, in almost every synagogue, you are talking about God through the prayers. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes, it's not... It, it isn't connected back to what's going on in your life right now or what does God mean to you. It's more like a, a rote, this is what I'm saying because I memorized it and I learned how to say it. So would you say six and I, in a way, is somewhat of a metaphor for American Judaism in that there's a lot of a la carte, right? So everything can mean something different to someone else. Right. And you welcome so many different people, so many different identities and interpretations of what it is to build a community or what it is to be part of the faith. 
Um, there's just so many different. It's kind of a melting pot of uh, of pick pick whatever yes. suits you best. Well, I think one of the things that makes Six and I so special is it is inherently flexible in terms of the offerings that we provide mm-hmm. and the people that we engage with. So we could have. 150 people here on the second Mm -hmm. Friday night where we have our sixth in the city Shabbat, Mm -hmm. which is mostly targeted to 20s and 30s. Um, And that will be a very different audience from the 100 or 200 people that show up on the fourth Friday um, who do a service with um, a local chazan named Larry Paul. And there are a lot of different entry points to make it into Sixth and I. Mm -hmm. And that is very unusual. So why why do it? Why is it important? Why is it important to create this community? Why? What are you trying to accomplish? What's the point of carrying forward? Obviously, you've spoken of many different elements, but it sounds like you're really trying to do many different things here. What's the overarching goal when you wake up every morning? Because we are approaching the end of the podcast. So I ask this final question. When you wake up every morning, what are you looking forward to? Why is it? Why is it that you do what you do? What is reinforcing the fact that you are going to have to put a lot of effort in? You're going to have to deal with different tribulations that are part of your job. At the end of the day, what makes it all worthwhile? Well, I, I love coming into this. This I can't even think of it as an office, right? Like I love coming into this building every day because I'm surrounded by passionate people that believe in what they do and know that they influence people in terms of giving them places to go and places to feel heard. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's so many different... I'm never bored. Mm -hmm. Never bored. Because one day... It's not like archaeology too much. No. It's not like (laughs) archaeology at all, thankfully. Um, And and the scope of things that we get to cover in the course of a day, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's figuring out how to get the right security for someone like Megan Kelly or talking about a sixth and spiritual email that we're sending out mm-hmm. about to Bishvat and the holiday of the trees and what that means for today in terms of climate conversation. Right. Um, I mean, or just figuring out how to get, you know, parking from the city when a tour bus needs to park in front of the building. Like <laughs> it's just it's such a diverse right. um, kind of group of experiences. And I get to do them with these amazing people that have created this place mm-hmm. and made it so special for so many. So that has been Heather Moran, Executive Director of Six and I Historic Synagogue, former Executive Vice President of Global Programming Strategy and Operations at National Geographic, former Vice President of Programming at E! Entertainment, and former staff at Discovery Communications. Heather speaks uh, about a journey that may resonate with many listeners, a journey that was not a direct path, a serpentine path from, from the the hills of Masada above the Dead Sea to uh, finding parking spaces for tour buses in in central Washington, D.C. She's someone who remembers where she came from more than anything. As successful as she's become, she understands that you don't start out that way and everybody could use a helping hand. And she really shows that philosophy. She demonstrates uh, that empathy uh, through her leadership and trying to build communities at a vibrant cultural center that that is the Six and I Historic Synagogue. This is an intellectually rich, uh, a vibrant community. Um, this is a community for religious uh, worship, but it's open to so many different people of different cultures. It's really um, a center of diversity, uh, an oasis of intellectual, uh, cultural um, openness uh, that she has created. And and I guess for Heather. Public service is is about building those communities and building those relationships. She speaks about relationships she's built over time with with other interns, especially with the relationship she's built, the un, potentially unlikely relationship she might have thought as a as a younger woman with her husband, um, and and that you may find commonalities in the unlikeliest of places. And for Heather, uh, that is what uh, allows her to advance the public interest. It's really about. Um, building relationships with other people. So, Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And this has been episode 134 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Remember to subscribe at publicinterestpodcast.com. Listen on iTunes or your podcast app on Apple products. You can also listen on Stitcher or SoundCloud or numerous other podcast platforms. And should you wish to leave a message, a voicemail for Heather Moran, you can call the phone number listed on the Contact Us page of the website and leave that message. It will be conveyed over to her. Thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you next time.